Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Welcome to the 2015 CSAE Annual Conference. My name is Simon. It's my pleasure to be able to welcome you to the conference on behalf of CSAE and also to chair this opening CSAE panel debate. We've got two very interesting uh, events this afternoon. We've got this debate, which will run until 6 o'clock. Then at 6 o'clock, we have a joint information session in this room between the African Economic Research Consortium and the Association for the Advancement of African Women Economists, which will lead us into dinner at 7 p.m. in the hall. In 1964, the economist T.W. Schultz published his seminal work, Transforming Traditional Agriculture, and he said this, there are comparatively few inefficiencies in the allocation of factors of production in traditional agriculture. 51 years later, this is still a controversial claim, and this is the controversial claim we're going to be discussing this afternoon. In a debate on the topic that you see up there, small firms, could be small firms, we'll get to that later, small farms, an enemy of growth <laughs> in Africa. We have just three rules for this afternoon's debate. The first rule is there are no teams. Don't be fooled by the furniture. We're lucky to have four individual speakers, and we've told them that they are allowed to sit on the fence as long as they do it in an interesting way. Uh, second, we're going to have initial presentations from all four speakers of just five minutes each to put some information, ideas, arguments on the table, and then that will leave us plenty of time for discussion. Hopefully that will be a lot of discussion among the four panelists, but also plenty of discussion with you in the audience. So please think of your questions. We'll try to have time for a lot of questions. Ideally, we would love to have questions that are short, to the point, and that draw on the kind of issues and controversies that have been coming out of the debate, or if you like, raise some new issues or questions. As always, we encourage you also to participate via Twitter, even if you're sitting here in the room, there's nothing wrong with uh, using Twitter, and obviously, hopefully, if you're watching online, or not even watching online, but just have nothing better to do other than follow Twitter, you also have the opportunity to participate. So we're going to put um, a set of Twitter questions on the screen after the initial presentations. Um, and if you have a question, just tweet it with that hashtag, um, and we may put it up there and then put it to the panel. With all of that said, let me uh, go on and introduce the speakers. In alphabetical order, Awudu Abdullahi is a professor of food economics and food policy at the University of Kiel in Germany. His research focuses on the impact of new agricultural technology, the effects of land tenure, as well as food security and nutrition policies. Sam Benin is a research fellow in the Development Strategy and Governance Division of the International Food Policy Research Institute. His research primarily considers policy, institutional and technological strategies for agriculture and rural development. Doug Golan has traveled all the way from Oxford He's a professor of development economics at the Oxford Department of International Development, Queen Elizabeth House. His research focuses on economic development and growth, including particular interests in issues of agricultural productivity, spatial patterns of development. Finally, Diego Restucia is professor of economics at the University of Toronto. His recent research focuses on the role of agriculture in development, and particularly also the role of factor allocation in explaining aggregate differences in productivity across different countries. Please welcome our panelists as we begin the debate. Thank you. With all of that said, it's my pleasure to introduce Diego to start this afternoon's discussion. Thank you. Thanks very much uh, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, <clears throat> it's very little time to, to talk about such a big issue. Um, let me. I have a, a, a simple message that I want to put out, and, and hopefully some of your questions would, uh, would allow for, for more, more perhaps de deeper uh, discussion of it. Uh, this idea that uh, the problem, uh, that there's a problem with small farms, uh, let me say that um, my view and sort of the message that I'm gonna try to convey is that uh, small, small farms is not the problem, it's a symptom of the problem. And, and this is a, a problem of development that there are many problems, uh, as, as you uh, are all aware, in, in, in poor countries. And uh, I'm going to focus on one, uh, because I think that it's, it's a big one. Uh, and, and, and the issue or the problem is resource allocation. It's a problem because uh, resource allocation or resource misallocation uh, uh, creates uh, um, uh, or generates lower productivity than that what the economy could with the same factors. And, and then that's going to uh, lead to, to small uh, farm sizes, okay? So just to start, uh, here's a picture that um, 
uh, co-author of mine, uh, that's how Adamopoulos and I uh, uh, collected data from the um, World Census of Agriculture on, on farm sizes. And just to start off the, the, uh, with the idea that there, is a, there, there are big differences in farm size, and there are big, big differences in the far, farm size distribution, and, um, and this is in large scale, this is related, uh, what, what you see is um, um, kind of poor countries, GDP per capita, so you can see poor countries, rich countries, and then average farm size in, in log scale. So if you take the 20% richest countries and, and uh, you know, look at the, their average farm size and the 20% poorest countries, uh, the factor difference in size is, uh, is 34, 34 fold. So one, one issue is that, so maybe that's not that surprising. This happens in other sectors. And the question is what, what, what accounts for this? So if maybe this is all uh, kind of general factors, then, then we will focus on those. It turns out that uh, in our analysis, we found that uh, kind of aggregate factors, and here I mean things like uh, economy-wide TFP, uh, the aggregate amount of capital, or even the land endowment, that these factors uh, are, are able to account for most of the size differences you see among developed economies, but very little of the differences uh, between the rich economies and the poor. Okay, only one fourth uh, we calculated. So something else is explaining these differences. And I'm going to try to connect this to, to, uh, to really productivity differences that are specific in the agricultural sector, productivity gaps that relate to, to the agricultural sector. The, other, uh, the one factor that we didn't, uh, um, we didn't uh, touch on too much in that, in that analysis was land quality. And, and many economists argue land quality is important for productivity differences in the agricultural sector. And so re recently, we take up this, uh, this issue using, uh, using data from uh, GAES. Uh, which basically gives you data at a very disaggregated level, geographical level, for uh, not only the, the yields that are produced in, in all pieces of land, but also the poten potential yields. We use this to make an accounting of, you know, is it is there something about the differences in the endowment of land? And it turns out that uh, when, you, uh, when you look at them, the land productivity differences between the richest 10% of countries and the, and the poorest 10% of countries is a factor of three. It's a big difference in, in average yields. Uh, but when you uh, actually use the potential yields, those factors, uh, that factor difference almost disappears. So it's not, it's not really like the endowments of, of, of the factors, at least in a systematic basis from the rich to the poor. So what is that something else? And I'm going to argue that uh, that something else is uh, resource misallocation. So in, uh, in, in the original analysis with, um, uh, with ASO, we have proposed that uh, perhaps misallocation of factors of production in the agricultural sector was to explain their low productivity. And, and in that paper, what we were able to do was to kind of construct a, a long laundry list of things, institutions, policies, frictions, that may potentially lead to factor misallocation. And, uh, and recently now, we, uh, a different set of co-authors, um, we have taken that idea to actually provide more direct evidence of whether indeed uh, uh, there is uh, factor misallocation in the poor countries. And so I've done this in different contexts, uh, uh, and the evidence is overwhelming for, for factor misallocation. In a sense, not so surprising, given the, the long list of factors that may lead to misallocation in agriculture. Um, here I'm going to focus on one. I'm going to focus on, on data for Malawi, and this is a, a paper I wrote with um, uh, Raul Santelalia, who is going to present tomorrow the, 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 the paper that relates to these figures. And so what we have here is um, a, a, the main component of, of the exercise we did is to actually measure productivity at the farm level. Okay? And this is a difficult exercise that re requires a lot of data, and I don't have time to tell you how we did it. Um, but believe me that we did the best we could, and this data is the best there is out there for measuring productivity. And that's what, what's on the x-axis. It's actually productivity at the, at the, at the farm level uh, for these uh, households in Malawi. And then uh, what I have in the, in the um, y-axis is the land size. Now what you can see is that um, there is no systematic relationship between land, land size and and, and uh, productivity. And by the way, this land size refers to operational scale. It's not about who owns what, it's about how much land is being operated at the farm level. 
And so uh, this, is, this is evidence of misallocation. And the, uh, the, the flip side of, of this issue is, is the yield. Or if you kind of take the output of the farm related to the amount of land that they operate, okay, let's call that, that the yield. This is strongly positively related to, uh, to productivity. And this is a problem because uh, what we know efficiency will detect here is that we kind of allocate factors to, to, the, to the kind of highest uh, marginal return. So we, will sh we should be putting more land into the more productive farms. <clears throat> it turns out that the same, the same sort of pictures apply if you look at um, uh, capital. So I, I, I'm, I'm going to mention in terms of what the aggregate effects of, of this are, are going to be. But just to be pro provocative, because I think this may, may, um, may uh, trigger uh, uh, many questions, is uh, to contrast this view this view says factors are severely misallocated in Malawi, at least land, which I'm showing you here. Um, contrast this view with the typical view that we have when we actually don't have good data for, for measuring productivity at the farm level. And simply we say, well, let's look at the small farms and large farms. So this is the same data. This is the, the yield, the output per unit of land in the same farms. But now in the x-axis, I have farm size. And you see it's, well, is slightly decreasing, so that's the inverse relationship, which um, uh, we know very well. But you know, it would be very dangerous, uh, from my perspective, I have argued uh, about land misallocation, it would be very misleading to actually think about policy or reallocation, looking at reallocating from the large sizes to the small, or, or for that matter, from the small to the large, from this perspective. What we need to pick are the more productive farms. So farm size, is very different from, um, uh, from productivity. And this is a general point that uh, I made with Richard Rogers on, in terms of how we view um, uh, kind of uh, firm size in general. When you have distortions, when you have uh, frictions, when you have uh, kind of market imperfections, um, that may put a wedge uh, uh, between size and, and TFD. Now, what does all this imply? And, and I'll conclude with, uh, with this slide. This has big implications for aggregate productivity, and in this case, for agricultural productivity. So if, if we do a relocation exercise where we say, let's take the given set of factors, uh, capital and land in particular here, and let's relocate it to the most productive farmers, even just take us given the same set of farmers uh, and their productivity. Um, if we do that, Aggregate output, and therefore aggregate TFP, or agricultural TFP in Malawi, will go up by a factor of almost four, 3.6 in, in, in particular. So I will say, maybe this reallocation is very extreme because I'm going to the efficient allocation of factors. It cannot be achieved. Maybe there are geographical constraints, political constraints, but if we can get 10% of this, it will be a big, uh, big deal. Once, once then, I'm not showing here, it turns out that these um, reallocation gains are strongly connected to land markets. In Malawi, very few farmers have uh, uh, titles for the land. It's mostly customary, allocated by local chiefs. Um, but there is a little land. There is about 15% of the households who have some marketed land. It was either purchased informally or, or formally with, with a title or without a title, or was rented in. So when we look at the relocation gains, it turns out that this 2.6 times higher for those farmers that don't have any marketed land, that, that don't operate any marketed land, relative to the farmers that have some marketed land. So clearly one, one issue is, like, is the land market institutions. Now, this reallocation or moving uh, the allocations towards efficiency also has big implications for inequality and poverty. And this is, these are big issues that we all worry about. Um, <clears throat> here we have computed the um, the efficient, uh, the, the implied efficient income. And here, uh, uh, the assumption is that you take the actual allocations and, and with the centralized efficient allocation with, 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 with rental markets, and then compute income based on that. It turns out that then income inequality will, will drop from a factor of 34 between the um, uh, richest 20% of farmers to the uh, poorest 20% of farmers. It will drop to a factor of uh, 3.4. And uh, not only inequality overall will be reduced, but poverty as well, because the farmers that are poor, these few ones, 
uh, their income will go up by a factor of 30, while the income of the, of the richer households will, will go up by a factor of only three. Okay. So big implications for inequality and poverty. Um, this exercise is very static in nature, but obviously a change in productivity of this magnitude would trigger a huge structural change. Uh, and, and just to put some measures of that, if you put that in a two-sector model, this would imply that employment in Malawi will go from the actual 65% to something like 4%, which is what you observe in, in some of the rich economies. Um, will generate a big uh, change in uh, average farm size. And, and those changes would trigger you know, even broader changes, mechanization, uh, uh, investments in, in farm, you know, further investments in farm productivity, maybe selection in the occupational choices. Um, so all these, uh, I think these effects are, are, are big and, and, and one thing it will be interesting in, in the context of this panel will be to talk about the, you know, what can we do or what can the economy uh, do to, um, to improve our locations. And, and I think uh, um, the direction we, we need to go is improve those allocations, especially those that are connected to land markets. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Diego. Would you? Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, and thanks very much for uh, inviting me to come and participate in this panel discussion. Uh, my presentation would be totally different from that uh, of uh, Diego. Uh, I'm not going to present the slides, and it's not going to be from my own research. I just uh, come to the literature to be able to, to have some issues for discussion here. Um, yeah, given the challenges facing Africa for, for the next decades, of course, uh, Diego already mentioned some of them, it is actually imperative to ask to ask if small farms are the enemy of growth in the region. Uh, to set the stage, I would like to draw on the cont contribution by Collier and Deckard on this particular topic. Uh, this suggests that five essential characteristics are necessary for African agriculture to convert on the performance of the rest of the developing world in terms of poverty reduction and in terms of growth. And these characteristics include a vast reduction in the number of people working in agriculture, a vast reduction in the number of people living in rural areas, a massive increase in the urban population, a massive increase in the labor productivity in agriculture, and a massive increase in agricultural uh, outputs. Uh, but given the current nature of much of agriculture in Africa, with around 33 million small farms cultivating less than two acres, or sorry, two hectares, representing about 80%, and an average of 1.6 hectares, low yields, limited commercialization, uh, declining, uh, uh, sorry, non-declining uh, population land ratios, uh, they argue that, well, it doesn't look like Africa is on the way to economic transformation within the next five decades, actually. <laughs> so based on these facts, one may argue that a focus on small farms could lead to a divergence in performance. And I said that small farms are an enemy of growth, as suggested by my friend Simon. However, it's on record that policies that are focused on smallholder farming have proven to be strategies for accelerating growth, reducing poverty, and then overcoming hunger. Thus, once smallholders have been given a chance, they have proved to be efficient commercial farmers. For example, the Green Revolution in Asia was led by small farmers in the 1960s, and that continues to be the case. China doubled its cereal yields between 1991 and 2001, uh, mostly through output from smallholders and they were able to reduce poverty by 63 percentage points, and they moved 400 million rural people out of poverty. If you compare that to Brazil, which the Brazilian model, which was based on large-scale farmers, of course Brazil almost reached uh, the achievement of China, but then rural poverty actually increased in Brazil. On the African continent, I found a study by Steve Wiggins, who clearly showed that between 1980 and 2000, uh, despite the low agricultural growth in Africa, 13 countries were able to achieve, uh, were, were able to double their output and also to increase productivity. What is interesting here is that 
these 13 countries are countries that are based or dominated by smallholder farmers, such as Ghana, Niger, Mali, Burkina Faso, uh, compared to other countries like South Africa, Namibia, uh, Zimbabwe, dominated by large-scale farmers. If you compare them on the rankings, these uh, countries are very, very low. Uh, of course, this proves little about scale that I must mention, since other factors are so much more important for agricultural growth. But it shows that to have an agriculture that we're dominated by small farms is no obstacle to growth. On labor productivity, which has been raised as a weakness of smallholder productivity, it is obvious that small farms normally allocate a lot of labor to, uh, per hectare compared to large farms. Uh, well, they create employment by doing that. Of course, the statistics uh, does not reward creating employment. On the other hand, you will find it difficult to, find, to give evidence of countries where like, with, with large-scale farming leading to high agricultural output, as far as Africa is concerned. And uh, as uh, Diego already mentioned, there's overwhelming empirical evidence in support of the efficiency of smallholder small farmers in Africa. Uh, the so-called inverse farm size productivity relationship has been shown in several empirical studies. That means small farmers have been more efficient than large farmers. We just saw an example here. There are examples, other examples on Zambia by Kimi, Ayal, uh, Chris Barrett from Madagascar, and uh, recently Chris Barrett, Mark Bellamy uh, from Madagascar again. Of course, there are a few studies that have shown uh, the reverse relationship. So um, I, my argument is that it's not a a debate about whether smallholders are less efficient or are an enemy of growth. It depends on the uh, policy environment, which, of course, I will uh, leave uh, for the discussion uh, later. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, thank you, Simon. Also, thank you, Diego, and um, I will do for, for leading the way. Um, like I would do, I'm sure many of you know I'm not an expert in this, in this area, you know, people like Peter Hazel should be the ones that we should be consulting on, on topics like this. But um, I'm happy to be here to summarize the, um, the, the issues as I've, as I've looked at them and to be able to help generate a useful discussion on, on what we know about, about this topic, what is it that we don't know and where, where can we go from here. Um, so first, um, just on the topic, I, I just want to bring um, a little perspective of what is happening in the African um, and um, the continent in terms of that growth is important, but as we've already heard from the discussions before, that um, um, inclusive and also sustainable growth is actually what is desirable. So one who wants to rephrase the, the, the topic to bring these um, concepts into it, because if you only look at growth, then we may miss the key things that are important for, for the continent. Um, and this is reflected by the African heads of state in their, in their declaration in terms of moving agriculture as, as a um, development being led by agriculture. And this is reflected in the recent um, declaration that they made in Malabo. And I just wanted to read a couple of them. Um, in declaration 4A it says to resolve, um, we resolve to ensure that the agricultural growth and transformation process is inclusive and contributes to at least 50% of the overall poverty reduction target. So just growth on its own is, is not enough. Um, and also they resolve to sustain agricultural growth GDP to, of at least 6%. So the key concept of um, inclusive and uh, sustainability is very, very important in, in this topic, which I want to bring in. So given that context, then, you know, I, 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 I want to pitch that Small farms are not the enemy of inclusive growth and sustainable growth in, in Africa. And some of the evidence has been, has been presented, um, but I, I want to add um, a, a bit of caveat that it has not been tested in the African case. So if, even though there, there, there are issues and evidence to suggest that there's potential for small farms to um, um, achieve um, inclusive and also sustainable growth, it has not been tested in, in the sense of the sort of support that is given to large farms, for example. And I wanted to um, just highlight a few 
a few of those. Um, so um, typically, um, the, the argument of uh, the existence of, of small farms and also the inverse uh, productive relationship, a lot of it is um, 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 predicated on um, the um, imperfect labor and land markets. And, and so th that means that there is room for some intervention to help um, small farms be able to achieve, achieve that. So if you compare small farms to, to, to large farms, then um, the idea is that small farms have not received enough support to help them achieve their potential. So for example, um, if we should consider um, subsidies on agricultural input, for example, you know, on average countries spend about 30% of their public agricultural expenditure on just subsidies in, in Africa. And we can look at some of the work that has been done, for example, Tom Jane and Rashid, they review a lot of the evidence on just agricultural inputs in Africa, for example. And they show that um, households that have large farms, they are more likely to receive these subsidies. You know? So even though the subsidies is, is, um, is indicated to be given to small farms, the evidence is that it goes more to, to, to large um, households that have large, large farms. And also they tend to receive more of, 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 of that support. And so because such large farms actually would have purchased those fertilizer anyway, or the inputs that are given to them, it only comes as a cost saving. So you don't see those inputs being reflected in productivity enhancement. And so a lot of the evidence will show that well, subsidies are not having an impact because it's just crowding out what um, the farmers who receive them would have done anyway. Um, if you take the case of Ghana, for example, um, Ghana started its subsidy program in 2008. It started with giving coupons to smallholders, so targeting smallholders. It only did that for one year, and then it gave up and then put in place a universal subsidy program. And so there, a lot of the large farms actually are the ones that access, access it. So it is difficult in terms of targeting um, 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 small farms. And historically, the, the evidence of um, small farmers being missed in such programs, for example, targeting export um, um, production that um, lends itself to export crops or commercial, commercialization are the ones that typically have received those subsidies. So again, if, if you look at it, you know, that evidence in that direction, then you know that um, small farms have actually not, not received the sort of support that will allow them to achieve, achieve that, that target. And so the ab ability of small farms to deliver higher yields has not really been tested, even though there's spot evidence in, in, in certain cases, and some of them um, I would have already alluded to that. So, I mean, because we are looking at size, it is, it is important to also look at large farms. You know, um, the argument is uh, what, 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 what is the counterfactual? What, what can large farms do? What have they done? It's important to also, also look at them, even though I, I mentioned that in the past, they, they have received a lot of the, a lot of the um, 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 funding, for example, in terms of supporting agricultural growth. Um, Many a times, uh, at least from, from what I've read, if you look at large farms, typically in the African context, it takes you to two things. One is large government-run estates or foreign um, 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 investment in, in agricultural land. You know, those would be the two, two instances. And that do not present a good case of, of, of large farms in terms of um, growth because of um, obvious issues. One, to do with land governance or restricting um, access to smallholders to land. Um, and the investment, because lots of times, you know, um, um, the proposals are actually not delivered. There's an investment, there's also under production on, on such farms, and then also there are some environmental concerns. So the counterfactual does not actually look good in terms of thinking that, well, maybe large farms can not drive the sort of um, inclusive growth and, and sustainable growth that, that we are talking about. But of course, it is possible that large farms may work. I mean, there's a lot of work done by Klaus Danninger and others looking at the situations where it might work. And typically, they think of those areas to be where, you know, there's um, um, a lot of uncultivated land suitable for cropping, but it's not in protected areas. It is also not forested um, and has low population density. So uh, that presents a context where you can have, have large farms. And in Africa, they cite six, six of those countries, Sudan, DRC, Mozambique, Madagascar, Chad, and Zambia as potentially those places you can have 
those large farms where it does not encroach on the issues that I talked about, for example, restricting access to smallholders, you know, and you still have to deal with environmental concerns in order to, um, 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 in terms of the context of having um, sustain, inclusive growth and also sustainable, sustainable growth. So it can be tricky. I mean, yes, um, in the pre-conference, pre, um, um, in the IIG pre-conference that um, some of us attended, there was a case on Ethiopia, for example, and I think there's a, um, a policy brief out, outside expropriation of, of land in Ethiopia, for example, um, which is a classic case of you know, having, um, trying to consolidate um, farmlands, like um, Diego was saying, moving land from unproductive um, sources to a productive sources. So um, getting farm, farmers to give up their farmland and compensating them. Um, a lot of the um, farmers in Ethiopia actually did get substantial um, compensation amounts from say $4,500 to as, many, as much as $15,000, which presents a good base for farmers to reinvest into other alternative income earning activities. But as the, so far the evidence shows, most of them have really not done much. Probably about nine or six out of 150 farmers have been able to do some investment. So large farm sounds good, but it can also be tricky in the sense of what the, the beneficiaries actually are able to do alternative in terms of earning, earning, earning income. And so, um, <clears throat> but it is, I think that also lends itself to think about that the size is, it's also important to think of the size. How small is too small? Because there's also some evidence showing that, you know, farm sizes be below uh, 0.5 hectare, for example, it's not good to support any vi viable economic um, farming enterprise, for example, or how much large can we say is too large. So that, 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 that is an important, um, important um, issue to think about in terms of <clears throat> in terms of that. So although I say that the potential of, of small farms has not been tested, you know, there is genuine concern that some farms may be too small, as I just mentioned. And so the the, the issue of trying to consolidate some farms will be will be will be important. But um, I think here the, the consolidation um, uh, has to think about how farmers themselves can still be part of that, of that process um, in terms of um, continuing to partly own, own the land, for example. Um, just one more thing, and then, and then I, I'll, I'll close. Um, um, some of the discussion on, 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 on farm size, at least in trying to think of how to improve the productivity on, on small farms, has been um, thinking of promoting a lot of labor intensive um, technologies. And if we, if we think of the future, um, I was talking about the um, comprehensive agriculture um, development program. A lot of the thinking there is trying to get the youth back into agriculture. So if you're thinking of the future that we want to get the youth into agriculture and the idea of labor intensive may not come well because it, it, it seems to connote drudgery, which we know if you look at the aspiration literature, a lot of our youth are not interested, <laughs> do not want to, want to go into. And so it is important as we think of how improving uh, productivity on small farms, labor intensive, drudgery, young people are not interested. Who is going to farm? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Sam. And now finally, Doug. Right, I'm gonna show some slides because I'm not sure I know anymore how to give a presentation without them, which is a little embarrassing. <laughs> following, following Diego and Uru and Sam is a difficult act, and I'm probably inclined to sit on the fence, but Simon said it was okay to sit on the fence <laughs> if we did it in more or less interesting ways. I'm not sure this classifies, but let me try. Um, so, I thought a useful starting point would simply be to make the observation that it's not unique to Africa that there are lots of small farms. As Awudu points out, we have lots of small farms in Asia, in many places. It's also, although we don't think of it that way, very common to find lots of small farms in the US and in Europe. And farm size is much smaller on average than we think. Now that's not, it's not clear that that's the efficient size distribution of firms. So that's something I'm gonna to wanna to toss back to Diego in a minute. 
What do we think the undistorted farm size looks like anywhere, and how would we know what it is? In, in Europe and the US, it's quite common for people who classify land as agricultural to receive tax breaks or subsidies. And so this encourages, and it's also in a political economy sense, very convenient for ministries of agriculture to claim that there are lots and lots of small farms, even though they don't produce much of anything. So just to give you a, a sense of what that looks like, um, we have, sorry, I'll show you a picture in a second, but most of the farms in the US are tiny. Most of the farms in Europe are very small. It makes us think then about what a farm is and how we measure farm size. Should we be measuring land area, which is what we're all implicitly talking about here? You could think about measuring value or value added. You could think about measuring a lot of other things. And uh, you know, as we consider agriculture moving in the direction of intensive animal agriculture or horticultural systems, these are very large and very valuable farms producing large shares of agricultural value added, but they're essentially factory operations. We have chicken factories and pig factories. I think they call them farms, but I'm not sure that that's really a useful way to think about them. So um, it does raise questions about what we ought to be measuring and what we should mean when we talk about farm size and farm size distributions. I've got a picture, a couple of uh, facts for you and then a picture or two to show you. But this is too many words on one slide. But 20% of the farms in the US actually, as defined by the US Department of Agriculture, which has an incentive to count them as farms, produce less than $1,000 worth of output per year. What are those? Are they really farms? And if that's the case, and something similar is true in Europe, where we see the, the um, for the 27 EU countries, 40%, 47%, almost half of the holdings are tiny. They're basically under about 1,500 euros per year in, in value of production. Uh, in both the US and the EU, large farms are producing a large fraction of the total output. So although the small farms dominate in the number of farms, the large farms are dominating the production side and the value added side. So in, if you took that seriously, then we're, we're talking about for Africa is not the disappearance of small farms, but perhaps more accurately, the emergence of a large and commercially oriented sector. And maybe we ought to be thinking not about seeing small farms disappear, but we ought to be talking about what, what's needed to enable the emergence, ideally the, the emergence without state subsidies and without uh, distortions in the other direction, but the emergence of commercial farms, commercial family farms for the most part. Uh, here's the picture for the US actually, the distribution of the dark blue here is the number of, is the distribution of farms, the number of farms by farm size. This is acres rather than hectares. Apologies for the lack of, for my native country's lack of metric uh, <laughs> units. So these are farms of under 50 acres account for about half of farms in the US, but they account for about 4% of the area in cropland. So they're a tiny, these are tiny farms. They're not producing much value either. Whereas the largest 2% of farms are accounting for about a third of cropland and are producing proportionally uh, much value. So we're looking at about half the value of, or half the cropland in US farms coming from farms of over 1,000 acres. So roughly 400 hectares. Um, Although I don't have a slide for it, those are actually family farms for overwhelmingly. So we've talked about large farms. I think the literature and the debate have mixed up the concept of a large farm with a, with a corporate farm or a thoroughly commercial farm. These are still by and large family owned farms. Uh, we see corporate farms and non-family management units in a very limited set of sectors in, again, primarily in animal agriculture and in horticulture. Uh, and in some plantation crops. So I think it's useful to keep this in mind as we think about what the direction might be for African agriculture. We're talking still about the emergence. I don't think anybody envisions, shouldn't say that. I think we have colleagues who might. I, I certainly wouldn't envision a future in which, the, in which the bulk of land area is devoted to anything other than production of staple foods uh, you're still going to see horticultural crops and you're going to see specialty crops produced in different ways and different, with different kinds of ownership structures. But grain farming almost everywhere in the world is a family operation and the scale is determined by the technology 
I think what we've underestimated in many cases is the extent to which mechanization might be feasible and might be potentially profitable in some places in Africa. We also get hung up on the definition, whether we're talking about, Diego made this point, but whether we're talking about the ownership structure of land or the management structure of land, which may take us in very different directions. You can have relatively large management units with the ownership scale being quite small. Um, so I guess just to reframe the question a little bit, awkward, I can't see my own slides without craning my neck. I think the question we might want to ask, or the point might be not that small farms need to disappear, but that we need to have some, we need to at least think about the conditions that it would take to see large, and here I mean large family farms emerge. Some consolidation. Uh, what are the obstacles? What's keeping this from happening so far? Are there distortions in place? I think we do need to think, as Diego has pointed out, about the barriers to consolidation of small farms. Land markets don't work very well in many places. Land markets, or you could say differently, they work to achieve a different set of objectives. Perhaps customary, customary rules for allocating land may work very effectively for achieving some kinds of equity considerations. And that may be something we should be very cautious about interfering with. But what are the barriers to consolidation? What do we envision, going back to, again, to the, the quote I think that Awudu mentioned from the, Durkan, the Collier and Durkan piece, what do we actually envision for the people who are moving off farm for this large fraction of, of the workforce currently in smallholder agriculture, but what are the obstacles? It's not enough to think about getting rid of distortions to, to land markets that would free up the reallocation of land. We need to think in some way, and Diego has made this point as well, What's going to happen to the workers? Where are they going to go? What's going to happen in other sectors? Are the jobs actually there? Um, we might want to think about what's happening actually with the markets for what the agriculture sector produces itself. Are there good markets? Are there well-developed markets for people to sell their produce to growing urban, uh, urban markets? And I think one of the things we see is that so much of the production at the moment in African food, the African food sector is for home consumed products. Are we gonna see opening up of markets for cities? We have consumers who demand increasingly processed and prepared foods, higher value foods. That creates some potential opportunities, but closing that loop and figuring out how we move both the workers to the cities as perhaps Diego would envision or the Collier and Durkan piece might envision and then create the marketing structures which would allow the food to move from rural areas, from larger commercial farms to cities. There's a big change that is required for all of this. Finally, I think it's important to talk about which of these changes are likely to occur organically and where we need interventions and what kind of, where we need interventions that consist of removing distortions and where we might need interventions that are, that are more proactive than that. And I think that's something we'll all need to think about a little bit. Um, to be a bit provocative, I'd say that there are some, some actors in the agriculture development space who are, who are intent on the idea that we should only focus on smallholders. I suspect that that's not entirely helpful either. At the same time, the idea that we should focus on large farms without thinking very carefully about what we mean by large farms and what those large farms should look like, how we get from small to large, I think that's not constructive either. So that's my fence sitting. And I think with that, I'll stop. Well, uh, thank you very much. Thanks to our four presenters. Um, we'd like to get into some discussion. I will try to come to the audience very soon. Before I do, I want to uh, try to draw the four panelists out on a big picture question of what they see the future, the long-term future of African agriculture as being. I did think it would be kind of cute for me to start with some kind of biblical quote, maybe something about sending workers into the vineyard or something. I couldn't manage it, and so I did the next best thing. I also uh, went to... Uh, <laughs> Paul and Stefan's paper. But I think it's an interesting point, and it picks up, I think, on a lot of things that have been said, because uh, Paul and Stefan here are asking about what African agriculture will look like in the year 2060, so basically 50 years from now. And it's interesting, I think, listening to the four of you talking, because I think we've got a lot of agreement, but I'm not sure whether this is disagreement insofar as it happens about the mechanism to get to a goal or about what the goal should look like. Maybe I could start with you, Awudu, having uh, spoken about the five things that Paul and Stefan outlined. I mean, this question here that they posed early on in their paper, what would be the defining features of the organization of agriculture in Africa 
in 2060. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, this is a tough question. Uh, 20, <laughs> 2060 is <laughs> 45 years from now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But let, let, me put it, let me put it even more bluntly. Are we talking in 2060 about a very large number of small farms, or are we talking, even if we're not actively moving people away from small farming, are we talking about large farms effectively dominating the market? I mean, do we want African agriculture in the year 2060 to look, about, look like agriculture, for example, in the US? You know, I was um, listening to a presentation, which was actually a panel discussion in New York, and that was in October, and uh, there was the uh, Minister of Agriculture from Nigeria, Adesina, and uh, it was on, the, on a similar topic. And what did he say? He said, listen, when I took the taxi to the center uh, where the discussion was taking place, he said, well, I could just see the skyline of New York skyline of New York. You know, you have very, very tall buildings, you have semi-tall, and then you have the small buildings, you know. <laughs> so all he was trying to say is that, no, we can just have large farms, or we can have just small farms. We have to have a mixture of large and small farms. The question is, Ole, how do we get an economic transformation, you know, because if African agriculture cannot continue the way it is, uh, economic development certainly involves uh, a reduction in the share of agriculture over time, a reduction in the share of the people employed in agriculture over time. So of course that will entail uh, so giving up some of the farms and some of them moving into the cities or even living in the rural areas, but then engaging in non-farm activities. So it, it all boils down to the policy environment that is created by the, the governments in Africa or the donor com community to um, help this economic transformation, which means, I mean, creating uh, favorable investment climates, spending on public goods such as infrastructure, education, healthcare, agricultural research and extension, and also fostering institutions to allocate and protect property rights and reduce risk. You know, if these uh, measures are put in place, then uh, we would realize or we would notice that the small farmers would be able uh, because you have some areas where land is abundant, but they just cultivate small acres because they are not able to increase their acreage. I mean, if I remember where I come from in Ghana in the northern part, the land tenure system is completely different. It's not private, private property, it is community based. So the farmer can get in a number of acres. So they are small farmers because they don't have the uh, resources to engage in maybe instead of uh, 10 acres, they just cultivate two acres or something like that. So if you put the uh, right policy environment in place, you will find that such farmers would increase their acreage over time. And if you also invest in education, infrastructure, some of the small scale farmers will move into the non-farm sectors. So over time, we will realize that the uh, farm structure will change. We will still have small scale farmers, but it means we'll go in the direction of uh, mm. larger scale compared to what we have right now. Yeah, if sure. we're talking uh, in terms of 2060, you know. Yeah. So that's just my take on it. Thank you very much. And there's some discussion there about almost, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but leveling the playing field, as it were, between Absolutely. farms of different sizes. Doug, can I come to you? You made two points, and I might be stealing both of the questions for you. You talked about this exactly this sort of policy setting. I mean, it's one thing to talk arguably about leveling a playing field. Arguably, when we look at a lot of large donor organizations, in fact, if I understand correctly, there's a heavy focus on supporting smallholder agriculture. I think you had also somewhat provocatively hinted that maybe uh, the United States should not at all be thought of as an undistorted uh, situation if we're thinking about farms. I mean, where, does, in your view, does policy push, or do we just stand back and think, no, it's about leveling the playing field for the next 50 years? I think within a number of the donor organizations, there is a kind of an obsession with smallholder systems and an insistence that we should only be investing in research or only investing in policies that are targeted to smallholders. I think that may be, I understand that as a poverty alleviation strategy. I understand it as a way of dealing with uh, the inclusiveness that, that uh, both Awudu and Sam referred to. And I think that's an important issue. I think it may be misguided in the sense that if we're thinking about where the sector is going to go, it's not only the smallholders who are gonna need some interventions. We possibly need to think about ways, again, to allow 
the emergence of, of that perhaps is consistent with what Diego would say, but the emergence of a commercial class of smallholders, of people moving from not talking about 1,000 hectare farms, but people moving from two hectares to 50 hectares, that seems like something that we ought to be supporting in some way, and I don't see very much that's working at that middle level. So I think that's an area that I think would be interesting, and I think the donors have largely, have largely stepped away from. I think it's politically unpalatable. I think smallholder agriculture is, um, is something that has a certain evident appeal, and I think that is where the donors are at. As for the U.S., uh, you certainly wouldn't want to take U.S. farm size distribution as anything like undistorted. <laughs> you could look at Australia as a nice case of relatively undistorted agriculture, I suppose. But then again, I'm not sure what those uh, 30,000 hectare things in, in the outback <laughs> are. They don't seem entirely replicable in other parts of the world either. Yeah. Be being Australian, I've never seen them, right? It's only foreign <laughs> tourists who uh, <laughs> go and visit these places. Diego, you must dis disagree with the comment about taking the U.S. as an understorted uh, measure. I mean, in your AER piece, everything was calibrated to the 2007 census. Yeah, I guess I want to go back to, it's not like I disagree, I agree completely with him. It's just that, um, you know, the, the, the world is a complicated place. And, and if you throw in a hundred dimensions, then we end up with no prescription, clear prescription of what, what to do or what, what are the fundamental forces. And so, uh, certainly, I do think uh, U.S. agriculture is distorted, but I, I, I also think that uh, relative to the distortions or the frictions or market imperfections that you see in developing countries, uh, uh, there's something there. A, a Africa will never look like the U.S., uh, like at least if, if you take kind of representative countries, because uh, just the land endowment is very different. Okay, maybe, maybe, let's say, Malawi will look like Belgium. Right. But the point that, uh, that I made earlier is that um, uh, if you look at the uh, aggregate things, like aggregate EFP uh, of countries, which may be related to other institutions that have nothing to do with agriculture, and those would influence farm size. Um, the, the amount of capital that got accumulated, there may be lots of distortions that differ across countries. So the point is that th those aggregate things, if you take, uh, if you take them, um, at face value, they would account for, for, for pretty much all the differences in farm size that you see between, let's say, Belgium, Netherlands, relative to the US or, or, or Australia. And so it, it, there's something about those factors that, that work, but the point is that for the poor countries, they don't work, okay? And, and it's resource allocation. And so when, um, um, when we discuss this issue, I think one, one thing that came uh, all the time, and I think this is precisely because all, you know, a lot of the data we have is about farm size, our yields, and th those are the things that we can easily uh, chew on. But uh, part of the, the, the point that I wanted to make when I, when I show the relationship with farm size is that you know, focusing on farm size is really um, it, it's the wrong thing to do. And uh, the way I would put it is we need to focus on a better resource allocation. Uh, the best resource allocation we can achieve, uh, perhaps with other good objectives like you know, uh, equalizing access to things or equalizing in income. Uh, you know, just to put this in perspective, for the U.S. in the last 100 years, average farm size went up by four times. In Canada, average farm size went up uh, by seven times in, in the last 100 years. In Africa, things are fine. They may have gone up for some, may have gone down. And, 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 and the question is how we think about this. So this happened even though perhaps there's lots of distortions, but there's something that allows the factors to, to reallocate. And I would say, coming back to the issue that, that Doug raised, that agriculture, even in the rich economies, is still dominated by a production unit that is the family farm. So if, if you take that as given, we have a very good framework to understand um, the reallocation process, in, in, in at least the total process that would occur, as the economy grows, and that is that uh, there will be a reallocation of labor uh, out of agriculture towards non-agriculture. That's what pro productivity uh, growth in the agricultural sector does. And so it is natural, small farms will not disappear, but average farm size will grow if the economy is healthy. So I will say Africa should look more like the rich economies if they manage to, to lift the restrictions that uh, uh, impede reallocation, that impede um, 
productivity growth in agriculture and, and, and average farm sizes increase. Thank you very much. Let's, uh, let's flick over, take our first audience question. I'm going to take it off Twitter and I'll throw this to you initially, Sam. The question right at the top, you spoke about inclusive growth and the question is, I think a simple and very interesting one in that context. Will small farms be able to feed the growing and increasingly middle class populations of African countries? Or perhaps to put it in other words, we're not going to ask you to answer for the entire donor community, but I think Doug makes a very interesting point about the extent to which donors should be thinking about, as I think Doug put it, a commercial class of small farmers, which may involve a shift in uh, priorities. Where do you see inclusive growth in this context? Yeah, well, I, I mean, um, fundamentally, I think the, the, the inclusive growth means that um, both involving all producers, but it's the idea of the inclusiveness means that there are some producers who have difficulty accessing markets, both input output markets. And so the idea of uh, making sure that we are targeting or helping those um, producers be able to gain access to those markets to be able to um, feed the growing population because they are engaged in slightly different production processes if you want to think about it. like a lot of the smallholders are in involved in cereal uh, more of the food security crops and then maybe some of the medium farmers large farmers are involved in more the export crops or the value um, horticultural crops so you have a you have a better strategy trying to ensure that those that are not able to access the market you actually help them too because mm -hmm. they are producing um, certain crops that are important in, in, in that process and so i think um, that's the essence of um, a lot of donors trying to push um, for, for the small farmers. I don't think that it's trying to leave other farmers out because naturally, like uh, the, the statistics that I was presenting show that they were actually being helped. Right. right. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Let's open up to some questions from the audience. I think we should take three at a time. Um, please wait for the microphone to come to you. Um, any, any questions? Well, let's, Hannah, if you don't mind, we'll take the first question in the front row, and you can find a question over here, wherever suits. Um, this is not a planted question, but it is a planted questionnaire. I did want to go for the first question from the audience to uh, Bola Awatide. Bola was here as a JAE Fellow a year ago from the Department of Agricultural Economics at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria, and she's been working on issues including rural non-farm employment in Nigeria. Um, Bola. Uh, thank you very much. I really want to appreciate the discussant. And uh, I think in answering the first question, which you've already discussed, I would like to first of all ask a question. And that is, the, my question is, if we say small farms are enemies of growth, then why are they small? Probably if we were able to answer these questions, then we will be able to know whether they will perform better if they are commercialized or they will still remain the way they are. In my own understanding, and having worked with the farmers for many years, I found out that they have a lot of constraint, which we all know about. And then uh, in Nigeria, about 75% of the over 160 million are rural dwellers. And they depend on agriculture for, for, for survival and for their livelihood. And if we say they are small, even at this extent, as small as they are, they still feed the nation. They employ many more than even the manufacturing sectors are employed. And I believe that if given the right incentive to grow, if given the enabling environment, if given the right support, even at their level as they are today, they will do better than any other commercial farm. Because if we say we want to commercialize and the situation still remains the way it is today, I believe that at the end of the day, that will not be a sustainable approach to agri development in Nigeria. And I also want to ask a question. And my question is from the fact that I have a feeling that with the right agricultural policy in Nigeria or in Africa, we'll be able to achieve a lot, even with the small uh, farm sector that we operate in Africa. Uh, for instance, I know Nigeria, we are not the field of policy. We have a lot of programs. We have a lot of policy. We have a lot of strategies that have been put in place to enable these uh, sectors to grow. But we find out that we have a lot of problems along the implementation line. You know, probably a lot of uh, corruption, a lot of bribery, a lot of, uh, a lot of issues 
along the implementation uh, 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 line. And I believe that with proper implementation, with the proper monitoring, and with proper focus, then this small farm can still perform better. Now my question is, how can we make uh, agricultural policy to be uh, to, to lead to development in agriculture in Africa? Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. We'll take a, we've got a question over here, and Hannah, if you can find another question. Uh, in fact, why don't we, Hannah, sorry, why don't we go to Fred, but first I'll take a question here. Okay, so my, my question for the panel is that we haven't really heard anything about economies of scale or scope, um, and it seems like if we're really talking constant returns to scale across the production now, I guess Diego says that there are differences in productivity um, across the spectrum, but I haven't seen that explained as, a, as economies of scale or scope. If, it's, if, if we see constant returns to scale, which most of the times I end up estimating a production function, that's what I find, um, then it's really just an issue about equity, about poverty reduction, um, rather than some, some issue about the production process. And so um, I guess the issue of tractors did come up, and maybe that's something to explore a little bit more, because that may be one of the places that one would see that. Thank you very much. We'll go to Fred in a minute. Let, I just want to take those two questions initially and perhaps throw them initially to you, Diego. There's a question about the shape of the production function. We could talk for hours, we won't. A question of the shape of the production function and a provocative question on why small farms are, are small. Now, if I can summarize, hopefully not mis-summarize your AER paper, this is a sort of Lucas 1978 span of control idea that there's some kind of diminishing returns, not constant returns. Now you have, therefore, why are some farms larger? Well, because some farms are better, some farmers are better at farming. I mean, that's one perhaps controversial way of putting it. I mean, what's your sense in, on these two issues? But, but right, so, so the, um, uh, the structure is such that, um, um, think about this, uh, imagine that this set of production units, these different farms are producing the same good. Okay, and when you think about that, the way Lucas thinks about it, or, or Hoppenheim would think about it in, in, in a model of the structure of the size of the production unit, uh, then uh, there has to be decreasing returns at the, at the, on, on, the, on the variable inputs at, at the uh, production unit. Okay, that's, that's, that, that is that model. But it turns out that both of the frameworks, when you aggregate them up, you, will, you get a constant returns to scale production function, which is perfectly consistent with, 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 the, with the findings uh, that people have. So the decreasing returns is only in here only sustain uh, uh, kind of what the optimal scale of the operation is, but this aggregates up to a constant returns to scale production function. So in that sense, it's perfectly consistent with, with kind of the evidence people have. Uh, but, but the essence is that then uh, uh, there is kind of an, there's an optimal size, and that optimal size depends what you choose to, to allow for the differences in the production, production function people like me or, 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 or in those basic frameworks, it's about the produ productivity or the TFP uh, in, the, in the production unit. But you can also think about some other features of the nature of the te technology, how you know, capital and land are substituable and so on. So it could, be, it could become more, com more complicated. But the basic framework is one where, where there's kind of an optimal size given the productivity. And the efficient allocation of factors will be such in that framework that the uh, uh, that you know, w what it should happen is that the, the, the marginal products of all the factors should equalize across all production units. The way to achieve that is that the more productive uh, uh, production units, in this case the farms, um, the ones that are more productive should command more outputs, should, should operate uh, larger uh, uh, machines, larger capital, should operate lar uh, larger land. Because that's the way to kind of reduce the marginal product of the factors in those, those uh, uh, in, in those farms to kind of the, the average, if it's a competitive price or, or this is kind of a, a, you know, a planet allocation. So in that sense, I think the, the framework is really not inconsistent with, with, with what people have found. Now, over time, uh, it, certainly I think that there may be some, uh, you know, in the Lucas or in the Hoppenheim framework, um, it's typically, you know, re recover a, a, a cop Douglas production function. Maybe that over time you need some factor substitution to allow for this, uh, you know, mechanization process and so on. But I think for the, for the most part, that, that simple story kind of consistent with empirical evidence and it has a lot of important implications in terms of the allocation of factors across these production units. 
Thank you very much. In doing so, you've just actually answered the most recent uh, question on Twitter. Let, so let me, let me push that a little bit further, just to come back to Bowler's question about why farms are small. I mean, Danielle has posted on Twitter a question about management quality. Now, in firms, Bloom and Van Rienen talk about large firms on average being better managed than smaller firms. I guess one implication of the framework you're talking about is that if we're talking about why are uh, small farms small in Africa, part of the reason may be that then these farmers are not as successful or not as good at farming as larger farm farmers in Africa? Yeah. Or uh, would you put the story just on institutional constraints all the way? No, I, I, I think the, the, and I think for agriculture, to me, uh, it, 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 there's something very individual about the, and I think this goes again to, to kind of the family, far, uh, family farm mm. and how, how things are managed. It's really an individual uh, ability to, to uh, you know, to, to, to get things out of the, the ground. And, uh, and so I, I do believe there is a distribution of, of abilities people have at doing this. And, um, uh, and therefore, there should be kind of a, a, an efficient distribution of factors am, am, are among those activities, which of course you know, generates lots of issues about inequality, about uh, you know, land is, without all the welfare institutions, land is a very important means of kind of minimum consumption. Uh, but I do believe it's an, it's an, individual, uh, um, it's an di individual factor. And just like uh, um, go, um, uh, Doug pointed out that uh, you have lot, lots of small establishment um, uh, farms and, and in the US they will command very little factors. The same happens in manufacturing. So you have small, small yeah. scale operation would occur in every economy. So in every economy, in every sector that we look at, you yeah. have lots of small enterprises. Maybe they produce a slightly differentiated goods. Uh, and, and that may be one, one route to explain it. So I don't think smallholders will disappear in Africa any, anytime right. soon, um, but certainly they should command less factors if, if this evidence I just show that uh, uh, what you have now is, is kind of an equal distribution of the land operation across all the farmers. And we, you know, the efficient allocation should be, should be one that kind of puts more factors into the more productive units. I mean, can I, can please, I jump please, in please, for yeah. a minute? And I'm actually going to toss it back to Sam and Alulu here a little bit, but I think the question of economies of scale is an interesting one. That the question might be, are the economies of scale, if they exist, are they necessarily in the production side, or perhaps they're more concentrated on processing, distribution, and marketing? And I think we have some evidence that that's the case. Um, probably there are people in this room who've worked on that more than I have directly. But I wanted to circle back, actually, to the, the first Twitter feed question yep. about serving urban markets. And my impression is that at the moment, one of the issues we see in Africa is that lots of the urban markets, so in West Africa certainly, are outward facing. They're importing increasing fractions of food from the rest of the world rather than facing inwards to their own rural hinterlands. <laughs> and that might reflect some failure to take advantage of these economies of scale on the marketing and processing side and my guess is that you guys have both thought more about that than I have, but I see that as an interesting issue related in some way to disconnection between the cities and their, and their own hinterlands, which is something that there might be a real scope for policy interventions that would improve marketing systems and distribution systems. Yeah. So I don't know if either of you guys want to take aim at that. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, that's, a, uh, that's a very, very important issue. Um, uh, that it, it just hasn't started now. It's been around for a long time. And uh, when you talk about a level playing field, well, first of all, it hasn't got to do only with the domestic policies. It has also to do with the international policies, you know, agricultural policies of the OECD countries. Um, they have made it quite possible uh, for, I don't know, grocery stores to import large quantities of uh, foodstuffs from Europe and from, the, from America instead of buying from the hinterland because of all these liberalization policies. You know, the domestic producers have become virtually uh, non-competitive with uh, uh, foreign uh, suppliers just because of the, I don't know, if I'll tell me dumping from the uh, American markets or from the European uh, markets, I mean, that has played a role. That's not the only factor, but it's been a factor around too. Uh, the second issue is 
that if you think of it, for example, you go and then you say you have a lot of uh, supermarkets bringing up in Accra in the big cities, but most of them are from South Africa, you know, and they just are surprised to realize that they import all the foodstuffs from South Africa and not from Ghana. So the question is, why do they do that? You know, these uh, uh, supermarkets that tend to promote uh, their domestic producers, but because of trade liberalization, the they, the countries actually allow them to bring these things into their their markets. Uh, what kind of policies can they uh, put into uh, ensure that the supermarkets take products from the domestic producers, as you indicated and Sam also said? I think that involves investing in a domestic infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Because some of the products produced in the hinterland tend to be non-tradable, you know, uh, because of very high transaction costs in transporting the uh, food from uh, the hinterland. They just kind of import them from the uh, from foreign countries. So I think uh, if these countries will invest a lot in their own infrastructure and also help um, domestic uh, manufacturers instead of, I mean, just leaving the markets to, to foreign investors who come in and then they bring in the goods from their own countries. I think that will go a long way to help domestic farmers, you know, who will then produce and get the products processed and, 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 and sold in the supermarkets. Great. Thank you very much. Let's, uh, let's take three more questions. Uh, let me go to Fred first. Fred was, uh, as you said, bowler. Fred's here at the moment as JE Fellow. Uh, as a senior lecturer from Makerere University, also working on issues of uh, small farms and agriculture, in this case in Uganda. Fred. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would like to argue that uh, the debate on agriculture production and productivity is not complete until we think about the climate change. And I would like to uh, ask, uh, think about smallholder farmers, we need to make investment if they're going to uh, adapt to the climate change. What form of financing mode is going to provide the affordable credit to small farmers to make such investment, to make them productive and survive the effects of the climate change. Great, let's, uh, yep, question from Louise, yep. Uh, I want to ask a question about employment. In our work on youth employment in Africa, uh, we argued that given uh, Sub-Saharan Africa's demographics in low and middle income countries, they actually were not going to be able to uh, release labor from agriculture, even with an increase in agricultural productivity, because there weren't going to be enough jobs created in the non-farm sector when the labor forces are growing between 2.7 and 3 percent per annum. So for the next 20 years, we didn't expect the Timmer uh, picture to hold. And so when I looked at your uh, numbers, uh, Professor Sukhia, about 60% uh, of the labor force and agriculture kind of disappearing, I thought, well, where would they go? And does this question of the demographics, the amount of capital that needs to come in, and entrepreneurial capital, et cetera, to uh, get the kind of uh, modern enterprises going in the non-farm sector, does that change anybody's view uh, about uh, the future of African agriculture, at least for the next 20 years? Thank you very much. And a third question. Uh, we can take a question in the middle here, if that's right. I've always been uh, troubled by the claim which Collier and Durkin make, which has been reiterated here, that um, uh, uh, consolidation of African agriculture would necessarily lead to an exodus uh, to urban centers. Uh, it seems to me that uh, there's a confusion here between uh, average productivity, which has to rise, and marginal productivity, which would be determined by the labor market. Is this a, a possible view? Thank you very much. I'm going to make a request that I hate getting as a researcher, which is let's try to go for brief questions if possible. Let me, let me start with the issue of climate change and maybe throw this to you, Sam. I mean, how do you see this? In a question of inclusive growth, we've really pushed hard to talk about jobs and yields and output and so on. I think it's a really interesting point to think about the broader environmental aspects, which of course have important welfare implications. What's your sense on that issue there as it relates to farm size? Um. Yeah, I think the, the, definitely the, the environmental issues um, are, are strong. So, I mean, again, it, 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 it's, they are both incentives for investing in certain kinds of technology and the scale at which that, that can be done. And so for, 
for, for small farms, at least the, the past evidence in terms of the inverse productivity um, um, hypothesis shows that you know, small farms are able to put um, a bit more labor into certain um, activities. So depending on what sort of technologies are available for, for small farmers to invest, then we can, you can certainly push the, um, um, support them to, to be able to invest in those, in those technologies. But um, at least the evidence on the, on the large, um, large farms, some of the environmental concerns have been using a lot of, um, 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 concerning a lot of energy on the farm, for example, using um, large amounts of fertilizers, for example, mm. as, you know, as opposed to um, organic fertilizer. So those are, there are issues on the, on, the large, on the large farms as well. But again, it comes down to what will be the sort of technologies that far, farms can can invest in. Great. Um, we have two questions really pushing, I think, at the same kind of theme, the issues in terms of non-farm employment, moving people off the farm into uh, perhaps urban employment. I think this is one for you, Doug. I, I read a paper recently where the authors said, and I quote, there should be large income gains from workers moving out of agriculture and into other economic activities. I hope you agree with those authors, but, but more fundamentally, <laughs> um, more fundamentally, I mean, where does this happen in terms of, if we're thinking about structural change, where do we get that demand for non-farm uh, urban labor? So I think it's interesting. I think the point that I would come back to is I think there's, in many countries in Africa, a disconnect between the rural and urban sectors, between agriculture and non-agriculture, and there's something going on there as well as in the allocations within the agriculture sector that seems that seems not to be working very well. I think my sense is that that might reflect, to some degree, infrastructure issues. So I'm with Aludu absolutely that there's physical disconnections. You have people living in very remote areas who are not well connected to markets. I think I think the point that that Louise makes is absolutely right. I think the issue of where the jobs, the non-farm jobs, are going to come from, is one that we don't have a clear picture on. I don't and. If you look at the demographic estimates at the moment, I think you're actually seeing estimates that for, I don't know what the turning point is, but rural populations are actually likely to continue increasing in Africa for the, the next couple of decades at least. So that suggests actually smaller farm sizes, if anything, unless something changes. What is it that's gonna change? I think we're gonna need to see some kind of growth in urban areas. It's not clear what the tradable goods are that are gonna be produced in Africa's cities I think this is a really interesting question. I think coming back to what's going on with large farms, I think there is potential. I think the question there is about, uh, is about capitalization. We have lots of farms with very little capital. So the question about average product and marginal product has to be taken, we need a second input. There has to be a third input besides labor and land. And it comes back to a question around mechanization. We see some places you know, in, in northern Ghana now, you see uh, sort of very large, very widespread use of tractors for land preparation. I think there are places in pockets here and there in, in sub-Saharan Africa where the economics, the undistorted economics of mechanization may be changing. I think this is a really interesting question. I don't pretend to have answers here, but I think where the release of labor is gonna come from, I think that's part of it. It's gonna come in the rural areas from some kind of consolidation, some kind of mechanization. Where the people go in urban areas, I think is a bit of a mystery. We don't see the kind of opportunities for export production or production of tradable goods. Is the domestic rural market sufficient to, to support non-agriculture activities? Uh, this I don't see either. So I think it's a big, I think this is the big question, is actually not thinking about what's, tr what's changing and what's driving agriculture from within the rural sector, mm. but what's happening in cities and what's happening in outside of agriculture. That's the key thing that we're, that we're not putting on the table here. And we haven't talked a lot about mechanization today, but just briefly, your example from Ghana was mechanization within small farms, counter to our intuition, effectively solving a coordination problem. That's, that's certainly my understanding of what's going on is this is, these are groups of smallholders perhaps combining and, and working together to figure out uh, schedules for mechanization for, for bringing in plowing, but Uru probably knows this better than I do. Yeah, I mean, is that the way you've explained it, actually? <laughs> but, but I, I just want to uh, come in and add a bit to what Sam said already, because it, I think it's an important point you raised on climate change and how to have smallholders adapt to it in this 
risk mitigation and adaptation strategies for smallholders is quite important because the gentleman behind you also added to it. I think the uh, required policies go in the direction of insurance policies, you know, to creating uh, insurance policies that will help smallhold farmers, you know, in case they have weather shocks or yield losses, or also training and educating farmers on planting dates because of uh, rainfall failure. Um, helping farmers with irrigation schemes and soil conservation measures. Uh, so these are uh, the kind of risk mitigation and adaptation strategies <coughs> that have come up for smallholder farmers, I mean, to uh, uh, kind of dampen the effects of climate change. Great, thank you. We, we started five minutes late, we'll finish just five minutes late. I wanna take one more round of questions. Um, Anna, why, where, where did I see those questions? Yep, okay. <laughs> Um, thank you very much. Um, I was just curious because be it whether we look at small farms or large farms or whether to convert small farms to large farms, um, Dr. Golan mentioned real quickly about markets, okay, and um, if we increase productivity in small farms or large farms, at the end of the day, we still look at are there markets available? Okay, so the question then becomes, um, do we still look to agriculture as a tool for economic improvement, for economic growth, when um, these economies, like developing economies, are faced with like uh, global, um, they are competing with global markets as well as um, global research and development. So, using Ghana as an example, we all know Ghana was really good in cocoa production. Well, nowadays it's actually even more expensive to buy dark chocolate, for example. Okay, and um, there's more, well, there's, you know, the joke that very soon you might find more vegetables in chocolate than actual cocoa. So with the markets, how, I mean, is it really a viable, you know, route to depend on agriculture when there's research and development that's actually changing the market? So that's the question. Thank you very much. Where am I? We have a yep, question yeah, up here. Thank you very much. Uh, this is very interesting. Um, but I was wondering whether, when you're thinking about Africa and the fact that it hasn't had a green revolution as yet, and that four out of five uh, you know, workers are still in, in the rural area. Why we are looking at where the farming is in the US in terms of size or where it is in the, in the EU, would it not be more useful to maybe look at what has happened in India, which has had a green revolution for now over 30 years, what has happened in terms of size of farms, but maybe very importantly, productivity, and ha has there been success, which I think there has been to some extent, of moving poor people out of of agriculture, or at least moving poor people out of poverty. So uh, if, if the discussions could maybe shed some light on whether, you know, there's something to learn from there. So I, I'm not sure I could think of 50 years out, but maybe 30 years out, what will African farming look like? Thank you. Thank you, and the last one we'll take right up the top. Right up the top, okay. Uh, um, my name is Haram Mukhayan, and I work with the governments of Su Sudan, Somalia, and South Sudan on kind of gearing their natural resource management policies more towards kind of pro poor growth and development and sustainability. Um, and what I find, unfortunately, is like most of their development plans for the next three to five years are geared towards agricultural expansion, large-scale agriculture. And I, I, I don't think agriculture has really worked. It hasn't worked for the very poor, it hasn't worked for African economies, and it certainly hasn't worked for food security. And so I'm a bit kind of, I'm, I'm a bit cynical about like the strength of agriculture and the way we see it for our economies in Africa or our people in Africa. Um, what I have seen works is, for example, Sudan is the largest exporter of gum arabic and exports the largest um, quantity of African sheep and goats. Somalia exports the largest uh, quantity of camels. Um, and so these are kind of value chains that are linked at very different levels and are unfortunately being squeezed by agriculture expansion. Um, what I like from like the talk um, uh, is that you, you not only focus, I mean, some of you have focused on farm size and productivity and da da da, da. 
But you also spoke about like ownership structures and alternative ownership structures and looking more at um, crop specific type of production. And I think it's really interesting to look at that, um, not just in terms of very hardcore agriculture, but uh, more kind of maybe agroforestry or agropastoralism and, and really integrating these different value chains and making that appealing to decision makers or throughout the decision chain. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, my question is, how do you think these, that kind of more constructive advice can surface at and be geared towards influencing policy makers' approach toward, towards agriculture? Um, Great. Yeah, that's my question. Thank you very much. Sam, do you want to jump in on this one? But I guess both the first and the third question there are really querying whether we should even think of agriculture as a tool for growth, um, particularly coupled with the Ghanaian experience. And what's your sense on that? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, we can't, we can't ignore agriculture. I mean, we, I, I think some of the, we didn't present some of the statistics in terms of the role of agriculture in, in in development, also in food security, etc., we talk about large numbers of people rely on agriculture um, direct for food, directly for income. Um, large numbers of people in the rural area, which depend on not just the uh, ag production itself, but also for the um, rural industry. So, uh, I think the key question is how to make that more viable, that people, um, those who rely on it, can actually make a decent more living out of it, right? And then continue in, in terms of production because when we talk of the future, um, I threw that out as in who is going to continue farming because it is, it is an important component in, in the economy. Even in developing countries, agriculture plays a huge role even though you may have less than 2% of the population engaged in agriculture. So agriculture has a viable um, contribution for the economy. And so how do we, how do we keep that going? And I think that um, there have been several um, policy already thrown up. Right. Thank you very much. I want to finish with this, this last question which was actually posed about India, not just about India, but I want to give each panelist just one minute. One of the things that I think is really interesting about this is we're talking about entire continents and entire nations within those continents with different policies and different resources and different situations. To wrap up, I mean, if we're thinking about the future of agriculture in Africa, where do we look for a comparison? We've talked a bit about the US, we've talked a bit about India, we've talked a lot about Africa. I mean, where would each of you primarily look and why as a comparator for where Africa could go, should go, maybe should not go? Why don't I take, take maybe one minute or less each just in the order in which uh, each of you presented? Diego. Okay, so let me, let me try to summarize because some, some, some comments that are related to this um, were asked and, and I didn't have a chance to say much, but I, sometimes I fear that uh, we, we worry too much about, uh, I mean, I think Doug put it in a simplistic way that I'm advocating a, a eliminating policies so that uh, resources are better allocated. Uh, and maybe that's a bit extreme, but sometimes I feel that we jump a bit too quickly in saying that, oh, agriculture in this country or in these successful countries look this way, so mm. what should we policymakers do uh, to that? And then we implement subsidies for intermediate inputs, so we give subsidies for tractors and things like that. And then when we see it, you know, after 10 years, we see that none of that worked, or we, we do you know, subsidies for uh, insurance, we give insurance, we give credit, and then things don't work the way we intended. Uh, and, and I think, uh, part of the reason is that we, we tend to jump into, into something that should be the outcome of a process uh, uh, as opposed to, as opposed to kind of uh, facilitate the process. And, and, and so what I, what I see, you know, going from 65% employment agriculture to 4% sounds daunting, and of course this is a, this is a, a joke of a counterfactual exercise, but the truth is, that's the reallocation that has occurred in all developed economies. We may not like the US because they have a lot of land, but pick any country. As long as you go far back enough, you're gonna have these countries going through the structural change. And so this will happen to Africa. I don't know, hopefully it will happen much sooner than later because that's what is gonna allow income to grow and these this economies to catch up. But, um, but should governments do something to facilitate that? And I, you know, I think that's really important questions that um, you know, we're trying to work on. 
for trying to, to, to make sure that this gets done in the smoothest possible way. But sometimes I'm afraid that because we think that uh, either Africa is special or that mm. uh, you know, th th they have this restriction, that we need to intervene necessarily. And many times those interven interventions don't work. Let me just give you one example. In Malawi, we understand intermediate inputs uh, have been very helpful in, in precisely allowing these, these larger farms to produce more food, allowing relocation of kind of a, 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 a less productive activities to move out and relocation can take place. And so that's all very good. But the question is, uh, are there really obstacles to that adoption of modern technologies, of modern intermediate inputs to take place? If they are, let's intervene. If there are credit restrictions for that, then let's intervene. But if they are not, then it's not obvious that we need to go that way. We need to ask, why did those uh, um, uh, farmers adopted the more modern uh, technologies? Uh, and I would think that in many cases you will find that it's part of, it's part of the natural process that, um, that occurs as, as growth, as productivity growth takes place and, and uh, the process of reallocation. So I certainly think that um, uh, in Malawi, going back to, to the example in Malawi, the, the implementation of the subsidy to fertilizers, which is very big, I think is highly ineffective. It's given, to the, it's given based on income and the poorer farmers turn out to be the less productive farmers. So this is a subsidy to low productivity activities. This is a subsidy that is well-intended policy. Uh, we all like to do that, but it has not the positive effects that we expect. And so I would, I would hope that we're a little bit more open to the idea that these countries will go through a process of structural change and there will be reallocation and that we need to allow, my, my claim is that we really need to, to, to help that transition by, by providing the means for a better allocation of factors across these farmers. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, come back to your question, where do we look for, for Africa? Uh, I don't know, it's, it's difficult to take the developed countries as I don't know, role models or to try to follow that direction because they're so far away. But if you consider an example I gave during my presentation, China, you know, which is also a developing economy, and the, the Chinese were able to move 400 million rural people out of poverty. They were able to increase agricultural productivity by, um, sorry, agricultural output by 63 percentage points. So I think that will be the direction we will have to look to if uh, I will need to name any particular region. Uh, in terms of the policies, if I remember what my uh, colleague from Ghana said, if we take the cocoa sector from Ghana, for example, dominated by smallholder product producers, you know, and uh, if you consider Africa generally, you realize that Africa produces about 75% of the world market's output, you know. But if you look at the, 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 the consumer value, you know, about 80 billion, then Africa has just about 5%, you know. So this commercialization or Adam value is not taking place. And this is a point that needs to be uh, taken into uh, consideration. How do they achieve that? Um, through, I think, the right education, putting, uh, for instance, or creating a favorable investment climate. But favorable investment climate doesn't only depend on Africa, you know, because the example I gave also depends on the developed countries. I mean, they, if they put in protective measures, tariff escalation measures, I mean, they kind of prevent African countries from processing their products and exporting to their own countries, you know. And producing just for their own market is probably not attractive enough for them to go into this investment and to process cocoa. They want to process, sell on their own markets and sell in the developed markets. But because of these protectionist policies, it's difficult for these countries to uh, gain or benefit from uh, this big chunk of uh, uh, um, value added. So uh, I would say spending on public goods, such as infrastructure, I'll repeat, education, healthcare, agricultural research and extension, and then fostering institutions that allocate and protect property rights uh, is quite important because the question the lady asked there was, why do we have small farmers? I mean, or why are the farms small? I, I remember going to Kenya once, and they went to a farm, there was this lady who was telling us, well, our father had a farm and when he died, we had to share it among ourselves. There were five, so each person had 0.5 acres, you know. Because of this imperfect land market, it's very difficult to 
uh, access land. So it's, it's, it's very, very important to uh, reform property institutions, property rights in these particular countries. I mean, uh, provide social protection for small farmers, that's also important. Uh, that will help them in terms of mitigating against uh, climate uh, uh, change. Great. So, Thank well, you. I would stop there. Thank you very much. Just to finish, Sam, and then yeah. Doug. Yeah. Just to um, add, add a little bit. Um, yeah, I think um, good comparison will be, at least on the topic of farm size, I think good comparison will be Asia. You know, there are a lot of um, um, producers with very um, small, small farms. I think that they and probably been declining. And so, but I think the key difference maybe between um, um, the two continents um, or sub-regions in the world would be that, at least I think that um, a lot of African farmers have access to land. And so that actually does provide a good entry into um, improving livelihoods in Africa because, I mean, there's a resource to, to, to produce with. But again, like I would be saying, it's, it's a constraint of being able to, and as Diego was saying, the constraint of being able to allocate resources, not only land, but the things that you need to make the land productive. So it is having those um, 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 policies and also the infrastructure um, institutions that allow um, farmers to be able to actually realize the opportunities of having that access to land. And I think that is something that is not, is not being realized. Thank you. Finally, Doug. Yeah, 90 minutes in is probably too late to say that Africa is not one place. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you can imagine some very different models in different locations, right? There are places that are quite land abundant. You could think of Mozambique. You could think of uh, parts of Tanzania. You could also think of places in the Great Lakes region where you're going to have very different pictures. So I'm not sure there's any one country that you would look to for a model. I think the the issue of where you would find, I think there's some really interesting things from, from China where you have similar lack of individual ownership of land or similar kinds of property rights systems in some ways and interesting forms of organization of communities to take advantage of economies of scale and production and marketing where you get, I know very little about China, but you, you see clustering communities agreeing that they're gonna grow, this is gonna be the broccoli village and we're gonna market broccoli um, I think there are places in, in, with access to urban markets where that's going to be a very appropriate kind of thing to see in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, I guess I'd just close and say that I think, in, in, although you might be interested in consolidation and expansion of farms, I think you probably don't want the Paraguayan-Brazilian model necessarily. But I think there's something to avoid, and maybe, maybe it's uh, going back to the question of inclusive growth, how that's achieved, how consolidation is achieved, may be more important than the question of what the size distribution actually looks like. We know what direction things are going to move in some sense. Uh, we do expect a structural transformation, and how it takes place is going to matter as much as the fact that it does take place. Thank you very much. Topic for next year's debate, how it takes place. <laughs> Thank you very much, Diego, Wudu, Sam, and Doug. Thank you for your questions. <laughs> Let me thank you all for coming and remind you that starting right now we have a joint session between the AERC and the Association for the Advancement of African Women Economists. Thank you.